we are in fact three groups that we are coordinating and convening this meeting. The most important one is our Minister Jose Antonio Galdanes from the government of Honduras, who is one of the topics that we are going to see here, the case study of uh, Honduras, especially the case of the Palm. And it's very important that the minister uh, has, <coughs> has been so kind to come and support this event. The other is the center of uh, commer sustainable commerce, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz, and the colleague and I have a special uh, feeling for this uh, institution. I am part of the board. And also, I, I saw it when it was creating. It's been a, a center, very visionary one, and has linked very early the issues between trade and sustainable development. And I think that what we are trying to do is bring this topic early, nothing is early really, but somehow early, so that we can create awareness of why it is so important to understand the carbon footprint that we are leaving in the produ produ products that we want to export or products that we are importing. I also want to um, introduce uh, my colleague from ECLAC. Uh, uh, he is the and Alicia Froman. She is the coordinator of this project, which is called Carbon Print Work and Export of uh, Food in Latin America. And just as an introduction, I would like to say that what this is about is if we can analyze the cycle of life, the life cycle of the products that our region, and obviously we refer more to Latin America and the Caribbean, although so I know that Ingrid and Ricardo will speak about more general aspects, but it is very important that they give us that vision because not long ago, and Ricardo and I, we are also participating in the World Economic Forum, where there is a very relevant uh, debate of the future of, com of trade and the circular economy and to where are we towards where are we going to regarding food? And what we are going to present today, we are talking about the whole cycle that comes from the prime uh, resources and what is uh, this generating regarding carbon footprint, the use of energy, the residue, what does sport cost, and what happened with the, with the use of uh, land, agriculture, this is a very important issue here in the COP and of course regarding energy and in the study covers uh, Eco Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador and we also have here uh, Gustavo Gandini that will give us also uh, his perspective. He is from the Dominican Republic and I don't want to take more time but they have asked me to be able to facilitate. I didn't bring my hammer, but I will have to uh, send them a card or something because everybody will want to go out running at three. But we do have the opportunity of discussing and understanding which way this topic is going. This is a new agenda, a more positive agenda, because we come here with the ministers of trade and we tell them that everything is a disaster. They say, oh, well, I am not part of this. I have nothing to do with that. And it's the same with the Ministry of Economy. But if you arrive and you say, look, you can get something out of the, the sequence is changes. Look at the consumers and the buyers of Germany, they are already asking how many uh, kilometers did the product uh, went. So we need to be prepared for all that. So allow me to give the floor to Jose Antonio Galva Galdames, who is the Secretary of Energy and Natural Resources. Minister, please, you have the floor. 
Good afternoon. I like to start by thanking God for allowing me to be here with you and also thank your presence in this important event. Thank you, Alicia Barsena, Executive Secretary from the UN ECLAC. It is a great contribution that is being developed for the whole region and also to our friend Alisa, Alicia Froman, th that she has been in Honduras helping us with this great work. We appreciate the effort. We also greet Kenji, Ingrid, and Gustavo, and Ricardo. I wanted to stand here because you know what is the syndrome of the tortoise. Turtle. If you are in an important event and, and you are just uh, providing a lesson or something, either you are listening or you are there, and there will be a moment of questions and answers, and they will say, when they ask, they just go back. And that is the syndrome of the tortoise. If you ask me something too difficult, I'm going to hide behind the podium. Let's speak about something very important, about the international trade and the food, carbon footprint. Something is a, a fact that has been developed for many, many years through history. The variance is the issue about carbon footprint. And that is very important in the framework of the com uh, uh, of uh, the COP. Uh, presently, the ca climate change brings extreme cases, but also great opportunities. And that is how the measurement of footprint it's uh, opportunity within the agriculture sector to uh, to save in consumption of fuel and everything that takes us to the saving of economical resources and also of a significant uh, reduction of greenhouse gas effect. And that is one of the main issues while we're here. When we get the certification of the carbon footprint, the agriculture sector will improve competitiveness, will enter different processes that have benefits internationally and nationally, and they will, and will allow it to enter some preferential markets. And that is important when we do a uh, relation between products and companies. For us, for the Secretary of Energy and Natural Resources of Honduras, it is very important to show this effort, the study that has been done, and see how we can replicate this in other countries, because this is an effort in a sector of great importance for many of us. We cannot just stop producing. There are sectors that are very important, but what we can do is to work so that we can be more efficient. I thank you for considering taking our country into account within the pilot project by ECLAC, and that we we improve our image as a country and also gives us a commitment, a great commitment of being able to implement the recommendations that are given in the study. And I know that together we can achieve the goals that we have established for ourselves. First, as a country, we have that uh, commitment and as a region, we have double commitment. So we are going to uh, try to be up to date with this competitive market. And in this occasion, I want to also thank for the support of all the efforts that have been promoted to be able to have this event to the Economic Commission for the um, Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, and for the, uh, from Peru, and for and for Peru, that has been a great host. We are very happy, uh, the delegation of Honduras, the ones that was here the last week and the ones that are here now. I want to finish by leaving um, with a message uh, from the president of Honduras that it is a good time to give a human face to human uh, to climate change and I think in trade we should do the same we have to think on the of, on the people the people that are in our countries of countries developing countries we have a lot of limitations but great opportunities our message is that if we achieve that the 
woods, it's an ex the forests are extension of our family, the families will look after it. That is why we are fighting so that the climate change has a human face in Central America and the Caribbean. And we want people to live with dignity. They have a house that ensure the future, a house with a roof, that uh, because uh, with the effects of uh, climate change they don't get wet this, uh, this, the floor that is healthy so the people can play there and not get angry a, f a filter, water filter so that they can consume quality water and also a clean uh, cooker so that they can understand that although they are not contaminating they don't contaminate their health either and they have like a family farm to cultivate their own food. This is the approach we want to take. We have spoken with the president and we think that if we give a human face to climate change and, and just making the forest an extension of the families, in that way they are going to be looked af well looked after, especially the forest. We need so much for the effects of climate change. I say goodbye and giving you Best regards, and I hope you all get back home safe and sound. Thank you, Minister. The President of Honduras, Don Orlando Hernandez, he was in Veracruz, and there it was about technical technology and uh, technique and innovation, culture and innovation. And innovation, one of the topics we address is that the world is moving. Uh, moving every time more towards a trade of value chains where a product enters and uh, enters a country and leaves and enters again various uh, the same country various times. Julie Lennox is here. She's our director of climate change of Central America. So anything she she has a lot of information too and also Jose Luisa Malniego who is the director of sustainable development we have been measuring what's the cost the economic cost of climate change but one thing that is very important that we need and is not present in these measurements is how the products move from one place to another they come in and go on they are uh, in different parts of the chain of value uh, 20 percent of the products of Central America are exported to the same area of Central America and the rest of the region only 14 percent. This is a very important, Ricardo, with your vision. The center is in Geneva looking at all the challenges that we are facing and then in a world where trade has uh, become uh, disaccelerated very strongly and we are entering a different dynamic where the opportunity takes certain relevance and the circular movement of the economies has an, uh, an importance so please guide us um, it is a great uh, uh, pleasure in the name of ICTST to participate in the panel and cooperate with the government of Honduras and also with the minister and his uh, team so with Alicia and the ECLAC team too I am going to do exactly what she has asked me to do instead of speaking about uh, thus uh, you are more expert of the economy of Latin America and impact of climate change in that economy or the case of Honduras that we will see it further on in the panel. I am going to refer to uh, the state of the thought and the, the state of the debate internationally regarding the relevance or not of international trade and the efforts uh, for facing climate change. It is uh, an issue that has to be seen from that perspective that Alicia has stated. We have to think in the economy of the 21st century and where we are going, moving to. Uh, the idea of facing climate change, we need to understand what uh, ECLAC has done and they have made uh, produced a report not long ago. What are the benefits 
for climate change in our economies and our territories in the way we produce the goods and services and the way they are uh, the process and how they are um, transferred and consumed to go towards the future is what we have understood in the last 20 years and maybe it has taken too long for us it means that we have to orientate economy towards uh, uh, lowerage of the amount of carbon this is a transformation proposal something that we have not seen in the past and we need to do it and at the same time that we are suffering very important changes in the way economy global ec uh, world economy is organized so what Alicia stated now how in the international trade today in the uh, global economy uh, it's more and more important a trade of intermediate uh, goods that have not been finished of tasks in the form of services that are given to the producers and the companies that cross the f borders more than once to finally have those products, the final products that go to the global markets. This is done through production networks, value chains, and that are, due to their complexity, they act under regular international regulatory frameworks, but due to their complexity, generate a change in the way as we had seen the debate on climate change in the past. Today that global economy and climate change are of a very transnational character has transnational characteristics and that was not the case in the past. It was a lot easier to understand before there were some pro products productions in certain countries that were produced in one country and were sold in another country. Now the production is shared, which uh, that is maybe the most important concept. The debate started uh, in the years where I s got to know Alicia. Uh, the international community was thinking about how, what we could do about climate change in the first conference about the climate and the preparation for the framework agreement. In those days, um, some of us, uh, we dedicated to try to find co a coherence between the different regulatory frameworks, the one of climate change, the declaration of sustainable development in Rio in 92, and other uh, national, international agreements about cooperation for international uh, for international cooperation in that language there was a presum assumption of a conflict between the liberalization of trade that was based on efficiency and production and uh, fighting climate change and there was the same idea of conflict uh, between uh, growing and looking after the the goods and that has changed in an immense way and it has changed because there has been an evolution in the way we understand the based of growth and the growth towards a climate uh, a sustainable uh, development we understand that in the debate the climate we are talking about tools to fight climate change that will affect the world economy. What results from this confer uh, conference and will confirm in Paris, the reduction of emissions to generate price for carbon, to provide challenges that we have, like providing electricity in a more efficient way uh, to and provide energy to 40 million of people that don't have it. All this has will have 
a great impact on the economy in general. So both debates, the one of climate change and uh, have evolved and trade and in the multilateral framework of the ONC and the regula regulatory frame, global frameworks, there has been a like a uh, blocking or stop, but not in the sinking and in, in the system of international trade is a very complex system that doesn't only include the bilateral agreements that were signed before years ago, but a series of uh, free trade bilateral agreements and mega regional ones that selectively integrate more profoundly the economies and they use tools that go beyond the the tools that we had in the multilateral agreements, but those tools are much more sophisticated when they, it comes to understanding the challenges of climate change regarding, for example, agriculture production and the challenges of uh, food security. And those more sophisticated tools are being analyzed in the case of our institute, we we have uh, made an effort that uh, gathers over 300 experts that is analyzing the way we have disciplined the tools like subsidies in economy so that they can respond to the kind of challenges we have today. We are trying to understand in all the sectors in, in investment, the measurements that have to do with the um, tariffs, uh, the borders, and how to accommodate them and sort of uh, adapt them so that they are subject to the fight of climate change and they can face the challenges we have today. A very quick example about what is happening now is a negotiation that was launched in January this year and has started, uh, it's already in the fourth round of negotiation in the European Union and three, 13 members of the OECD, the OCDE, and include uh, about environmental goods. It goes in parallel with our other plurilateral negotiations that is working with the, in the trade of services. In both, we are dealing with renewable energy with a political motivation that is contribute to climate change. Those are the central issues and to generate an in, a strong international market of technologies for renewable energy and how the services associated to it can operate to operate this technology. So there is a very specific answer to this type of challenges. If things go well, maybe these negotiations that include goods for about a th 1,000 million dollars a year, uh, a trillion in English. It's a negotiation that will uh, collaborate to the Conference of Climate Change of the Parties in Paris. That's an example. There are other examples that have to do with the bilateral agreements. Uh, like the one between the U European Union and Singapore that already incorporates uh, elements that are specific to answer to this specific climate change issues. It is clear, as I said before, that the measurements that the government will take, we don't really know very uh, clearly how they're going to justify them will be measures that will affect competitiveness uh, international between the countries and the way we do production and it's very important to continue therefore we need to continue with this debate so that there is coherence and among the different ideas and that is what we are doing today i'm going to stop here 
but uh, if you want more details, more technical details, if you want in the round of questions, answers and questions. Thank you, Ricardo. I think that is this very interesting, your point about what will be the new elements that will be there after the agreement of Paris, if there is one, what will be the impact in a, such a relevant topic? We come from a region that really uh, um, bet on the open of uh, open trade, and we need to understand which way will the world of trade go so that we know how we are going to adapt our exporting structure to that world. So if you allow me, I will give the world to Kenji Inoue because I think that a very important issue is which way trade is moving to towards which we are not going to have the same dynamic trade that we had in the 80s. That's not going to be recovered. Uh, really, trade is going down. And that is uh, what uh, I want you to explain us, because we are worried. Thank you, Alicia. I I do not have the syndrome of the tortoise, but, but there are no in, not enough microphones. But if I want to add my um, my thanks to Honduras and I see. TD, TST to make this event together because it would not have been possible with the competence of side events. But we are very, very uh, happy to be here with this group of experts. The issue of today of measuring uh, the environmental impact in trade is especially relevant in the world uh, economic uh, issue. As we know, in the last decades there have been great changes in the uh, world situation, especially with the ICTS, the more weight of the Chinese economy, not only in the world product, but also in world trade. The, as uh, Mr. Melendez mentioned, the process of production is more related to this great value change, global value change. Chains. And as it was mentioned before, there is a greater interest in having mega agreement, commerce agreements. And that is what is happening in the OMC. But all these trends, what they have done, they, are, they have made the production and services more dynamic. And this has increased the demand of uh, inputs of bigger technology and produced in a more efficient way way. And this has put a lot of pressure in Latin America and the Caribbean countries, and not only to open the market, but to produce better and more uh, experts. And this it has not always been seen in a sustainable way, and this is what we have convened here today, so that we can face more competition to enter these markets. But effect, in effect, we have seen that the exports have um, increased, except in the 2009, but, but as from 2012, the exports of the area have sort of stagnated, and in the last two years, they have been reduced, the export stores uh, to the world. And this demand, or excuse me, just to answer the question of Alicia, we don't expect this trend to change in the next few years due to the, the weakening of the developed economies and also the prices of commodities, which are quite low, and, and the, mix, and the um, diminishing of the growth in China. 
And if we see the participation of the, uh, uh, the export of the countries that Alicia mentions, only 6% of the world export. And that has stagnated in at least the last two decades. Therefore, I see that the links between one, re reducing climate change, reducing the footprint, the carbon footprints, and the more integration of value chains, and uh, all these links are uh, closer and closer together, and they should be part of this new agenda that we are going to speak later on. And I also wanted to say that in Japanese and also in Chinese, the word crisis, which is pro, uh, uh, pronounced kiki, the first character means uh, danger and the second opportunity. And this is why we are here together so that we don't take this opportunity only to reduce the effects of climate change, but take this opportunity to, re to make export more efficient, but also to enter these niche markets that will have more demand. Y un dato que no diste, que yo creo que para la región es bien preocupante, fíjense que el comercio, las exportaciones de América Latina y el Caribe en 2011 representaban un 23%. Este año no van a pasar de 0.8%, o, o menos incluso, pero 0.8%. Entonces, la caída ha sido muy fuerte y esto, esto realmente es muy, muy importante. Let me turn to English, because we are going to have now... Uh, the participation of Ingrid, Ingrid Genu. I think we have interpretation, right? Si, sí. okay, very good. So Ingrid, Ingrid is, um, you know, she, she was, uh, I, I don't know, I think you're Swedish, right? Yes. Because you were in the, you were uh, in charge of trade and, um, and, and, and I mean, you're now in charge of trade, climate change, and competitiveness, but in Sweden, you were in the board of trade, which is very important, and before that, in the Swedish Institute for Food and Agricultural Economics. So we are very happy, uh, Ingrid, that you're gonna bring us, I hope, a, um, a, a vision of how, how do you see this, this link between trade, climate change, and competitiveness, and maybe in that sector that you are, or you come from, which is food and agriculture. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Alicia. Um, uh, I feel a bit like the, I like the black sheep on this panel because I'm the only person who's not from Latin America <laughs> and I also am the only Being, uh, person who don't speak Spanish so apologies if you have to listen to the interpretation um, so I would like to um, speak a bit about embedded carbon um, and I have some slides so embedded carbon and trade trends and policy options so uh, first I would like to just go briefly to a couple of definitions. Uh, so first, uh, territorial emissions, which are um, emissions as we are used to thinking about them, meaning uh, carbon dioxide emissions attributed to the country in which they occur. The opposite side is con consumption-based emissions, uh, where carbon, carbon dioxide emissions occurring anywhere in the world and attributed to the country consuming the goods and services. And then, of course, we have land use change emissions, uh, where the emissions relate to land use, land use change, and forestry. So, here I wanted to give you um, an idea of world territorial emissions. Uh, this is fairly well known to, to many of us, uh, with the two biggest uh, dots in, in China and, and the US. Um, but you can see also Russia, <coughs> India and so on have, have big dots. In the EU we have many black dots. Uh, they are, have been, um, there is a round, uh, a red circle surrounding them. Uh, in the next image, you will see how the dots change. Um, so I'll go back and forth like this. And you can see that there is a change, in particular in the EU, where the dots become much bigger. Uh, but actually, ranking countries according to consumption emissions, it doesn't create vastly different lists than territorial emissions. So looking at the, the trends over time, 
it becomes evident that that in countries like the EU, uh, European mitigation policies like, for instance, an, an emissions trading scheme in place since um, 2005, uh, we can see that territorial emissions, so the top graph, they have uh, decreased. So the EU is the red line. Um, and if you look at the bottom uh, graph, you can see uh, that there ha has actually been an increase uh, in the consumption-based emissions from the EU. So I think that the EU is the, the region where you can see the biggest differences. <coughs> and of course, the, 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 the <coughs> explanation to all of this is, as we've heard from the other speakers, um, trade trade flows. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, graph. Um, I think it's, it's very illustrative. So it shows um, the dominant next net exporting countries in blue uh, and dominant net importing countries, so importing of emissions in red. And as you can see, the arrows actually go both ways, meaning that even the net importers, they do uh, export some emissions as well. So um, China is the largest net exporter of emissions, followed by Russia, Middle East, South Africa, Ukraine, and India. Um, and the main net importers are the US, um, Japan, the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Um, and in fact, um, globally, carbon emissions embodied in trade are growing. So in the early 1990s, embedded carbon was um, not very significant, but nowadays, uh, as much as one third of uh, EU emissions relate to uh, consumption of imported carbon. So the question is then, is this carbon leakage? Well, most likely not, uh, because the, the carbon policies, the carbon prices that we have in, in, in um, the, the net exporting countries um, uh, are not that stringent or haven't been so far. In the case of the EU, the, the carbon price is very low. Uh, and there are also uh, mechanisms in place to mitigate the risks for carbon leakage. So I think that this is rather a reflection of what we also heard from the previous speakers. Um, the increasing presence of emerging economies uh, in the world market, uh, the growth of market integration, and um, increasingly globalized value chains. <coughs> so this I have to thank uh, our, our research partners in a, carb in a research project that we are involved in called the Carbon Cap. Uh, and they have produced this uh, graph uh, which shows embedded carbon per, per sector in the EU. So the reason why I, I have this for the EU is that that's, where the, that's what we have been focusing on in our work. Uh, so this is a bit of a, um, a tricky uh, graph, but we'll start by looking on the top chart. Uh, where you can see that the green parts of the staples are the uh, emissions that have been imported in each sector from countries outside the EU. So what you can see, for instance, is that um, embedded carbon account for an important share of emissions in manufacturing, construction, metals pro uh, production and processing. Um, I put a little circle around the food staple as well, since that's what, what we're going to hear more about later, where you can see that um, uh, embedded emissions imported from outside the EU account for approximately 20% of the emissions in the food sector. Um, in the bottom graph, we can see uh, the development over time, where we can see that emissions in many of these sectors have uh, decreased. Um, but uh, with the exception of the transportation uh, sec uh, sector. But what's also interesting to see is that the so scope three um, emissions, meaning the, the embedded carbon, has actually increased across the board. So the question is what to do about this? Is, it, is, the, is the solution to restrict trade? Well, <clears throat> most likely not. Uh, what needs to be done is to address emissions uh, where they occur, so at the production level, but also at the consumption level. So by moving away from fossil fuels and increasing energy efficiency, but also uh, reduce um, emissions at the consumption level by influencing consumers to consume less and differently, and also um, influence their, their behavior in the use phase, because that's also an important source of, of emissions. And I think we'll hear a bit from Alicia about that as well a bit later on. 
So on the production side, um, in the UNFCCC, the, the focus is on, on territorial emissions. So uh, there is a lot of focus, of course, in climate po mitigation policies on the production side. Um, this um, map uh, I have borrowed from the World Bank, and it shows um, so the different carbon pricing instruments, so um, emissions trading schemes, but also um, other taxes, uh, carbon taxes, uh, and so on. Um, so what we can see is that I mean there, there are m many countries undertaking considerable efforts to address <coughs> emissions at the production level. Um, so the reverse side of the coin is um, consumption level. So this project that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the idea behind that project is to, uh, to better understand embedded carbon in trade or embedded carbon in general, um, <clears throat> and, and after that to design, um, identify and design and propose policies that would address um, emissions at the consumption level. So we're about one year into this project, it's a, it's a three and a half year project, so it's still the early, early stages, but, um, but I wanted to show this table with you, which is... Um, it's a, a, a non-comprehensive illustration of some examples of different consumption-based policies. Um, so, so the um, light blue shows the policy point of intervention, and the, the dark blue shows the desired impact. Uh, so if we look at, for instance, uh, product labeling, which is on the first row, you can see that the policy intervention will occur at the level of intermediary consumers. So in the case of food, again, uh, that would be uh, Nestle deciding to label its chocolate with a carbon footprint label, and this is intended to influence uh, the consumers. So that's where you see the intended impact. So if we take another example, for instance, public procurement, which is towards the bottom, you can see that the the policy point of intervention is um, at the level of the downstream consumers. Um, so for instance, it could be like a local government procuring motor vehicles, which we saw earlier in, in one of the slides, is one of the sectors where you have a lot of uh, embedded carbon. But the intended impact actually goes all the way back to the upstream producers. So I have to say one of the challenges with this project is to distinguish between consumption-based policies and production um, oriented policies because um, even if you target the consumer it will have an impact on the producers. So um, just a few final remarks. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so with the knowledge we have now with, the, with these arrows um, where we see the, the embedded carbon in trade, um, maybe it would have been preferable for the UNFCCC to adopt a consumption based um, uh, approach to emission reductions, uh, but I think that it's not, it would not be a good idea to change now. That would just delay uh, progress at a point when we cannot afford that. But uh, rather, I think that the in <coughs> understanding of embedded carbon across borders should be used as a complement to territorial emissions accounting and to inform policy making. Um, and another conclusion. Um, at this point that I would like to, to draw is uh, just to highlight the necessity of technology development and diffusion. Uh, because if more countries have access to the best um, available technologies, it would to some extent level uh, the differences when it comes to embedded carbon. So it would become um, a bit of a less of a problem. And this is also why we are so um, pleased about this development that, that Ricardo mentioned about the trade agreement in the area of environmental goods. Uh, where we see actually an, an important potential for addressing climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I think you gave us a very good uh, overview of, I think, something that uh, it's very interesting to see the way you, you, you look at it, and that is how much exports of, I mean, it's very interesting, the, the, the fluxes of, uh, it's not only the territorial uh, emissions, but also how, how are they moving around, and that I think it's a very innovative concept. Now I would like to
to uh, cover quickly the next item. Alicia Framing has done a very interesting and important study that is a very good complement to what ECLAC has been doing and what concerns uh, climate change, uh, finance, and economics. One of the uh, most important issues in this respect in Latin America is the change in land use because our region is, uh, emits only 9% of uh, GEG, but out of that 9%, 21% uh, comes precisely from uh, changing land uses and activities that are related basically to agriculture. And uh, moreover, we have also s realized that uh, should uh, temperature increase by 2.5 uh, degrees Celsius, the cost to Latin America and the Caribbean would be on average 3% uh, of uh, GDP. And uh, of course, this uh, fluctuates because we're talking here about uh, a very uh, dissimilar region. And that would basically be between 1.5 and 5% of GDP. You know, averages are not always very reliable. But uh, why is agriculture so important? Because it accounts for 5% of the total uh, region's GDP. And 16% of the uh, working age population are engaged in the agricultural industry. Thirdly, because it accounts for 23% of the region's exports. It is a very significant uh, amount of exports of agricultural products. And uh, it also accounts for 22% of the population. That that's not very much, actually, but 78% of the uh, people in Latin America and the Caribbean live in the cities, but 22% still live in the countryside. There are countries like Honduras, for instance, or the other countries that are included in this report, the Dominican Republic, mostly Central American countries where agriculture plays a crucial and vital role, and consequently, um, analyzing the uh, carbon footprint in key industries and uh, is, is extremely important. And Alicia is b basically going to be uh, uh, sharing with us what are the industries that have been uh, analyzed in the study, including things like coffee and cacao and uh, you know, uh, palm tree, which is uh, one of the uh, sector uh, uh, surveys that uh, we have done. And all that is uh, so important because uh, later with the uh, assistance from our uh, Dominican friends, and we are going, and colleague Gustavo, we're going to uh, look, uh, delve into what uh, we actually need to do so that we can uh, tackle the uh, carbon footprint issue. Just like Ingrid just detailed, not only looking at the uh, impact, the ter uh, territorial impacts like we did in ECLAC, but uh, also what uh, this study has done, the flows of goods and services that are linked, that are, that are uh, carbon embedded, and that is what we call the carbon footprint. If this agreement is going to, uh, the road that we're taking is going to take us to have a lower uh, carbon footprint, it is absolutely worthwhile doing a, uh, an x-ray of our uh, goods and service and uh, flow, straight flows. Yes, Alicia, over to you to trade your insights into this. Good afternoon. I have always decided to talk from the podium because apparently the um, you can uh, hear me uh, better. I'm going to try and uh, please both the uh, Spanish speakers and the uh, English speakers because I will be speaking in Spanish, but the transparencies are in English anyway at our uh, website and the ICPSD's uh, website. The uh, transparency are, uh, transparencies are also published in uh, Spanish. Uh, to begin with, I would like to thank the Honduran uh, government, in particular uh, Secretary Galdames, um, and as well as our partners. ICTSD for uh, this opportunity to share with you some of the uh, findings of our carbon footprint and uh, food exports uh, survey for Latin America and the Caribbean, the LAC region that uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, engaged in uh, at CEPAL for three years already and uh, the first stage of which and precisely here with this uh, uh, presentation of our uh, fundings, findings at uh, COP20. COP I also want to thank in particular the uh, French uh, Cooperation and Michel Schlossberg that uh, has uh, 
provided her unconditional support throughout the study and that uh, basically uh, made it possible to um, invite other Latin American colleagues and other Latin American participants to join the project and some of whom are here and who will also be uh, uh, joining us in other uh, events in uh, Peru parallel to COP. Um, having said that, uh, as uh, Ingrid said, who uh, showed us also this uh, transparency has uh, explained that uh, uh, climate change is a cross-cutting issue and uh, we are reaching this uh, climate change issue from the uh, side of international trade and KG already uh, shared his insights about this uh, a moment ago and uh, we our starting point is this uh, embedded uh, carbon uh, concept that uh, Ingrid explained to us because um, frequently there are some countries that are responsible for carbon emissions where others are uh, those that um, consume them or get them, receive them. What have we done as part of our project? We um, set ourselves the goal to a work hand-in-hand -hand with Latin American producers who are in uh, the uh, in the first link of uh, the uh, food supply chain, which uh, that's what uh, uh, Ingrid uh, called the upstream of the uh, supply chain. And uh, our objective uh, there was to strengthen uh, government uh, and uh, food exporters' uh, capacities to uh, uh, adapt to uh, climate change, and in particular, uh, uh, carbon footprint measuring and labeling. We uh, did this project in five countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and the DR. And uh, we uh, also provided a support to a parallel project that was underway here in Peru, precisely. And uh, what have we done so far in this uh, field? Well, of course, we have uh, um, engaged in the more traditional sort of activities like training, dissemination, national workshops, international workshops. Um, some uh, work on uh, private and uh, industry good practices. We have a prepared number of uh, handbooks in if as the last component of this work, we prepared a national action plans that would address these issues in the future. However, a uh, central issue uh, component of this project were these uh, case studies where we uh, measured uh, the uh, carbon uh, footprint uh, to basically aim at establishing sector benchmarks and um, in uh, with uh, 46 uh, companies for seven uh, export goods, uh, palm tree oil in Honduras and Ecuador, bananas in the DR, cacao in also in the DR, uh, coffee and cocoa in Nicaragua, uh, shrimp in Ecuador and uh, stevia and old chuva. Old chuva is uh, goldenberry. Fisalis. Fisalis in Colombia. Goldenberry or Fisalis in Colombia. And uh, these, the, the, these goods and products were uh, determined by the countries themselves. Um, and uh, our uh, work uh, method basically consisted in uh, uh, Organizing these um, government uh, industry round table or technical uh, teams, work teams, because this is the only way that we can uh, actually take a look at uh, what's going on in these, as part of these uh, go uh, country export uh, strategies. He, in, in this respect, uh, from on the government side, we had uh, the uh, expert promotion boards, basically, who were our uh, main uh, sponsors in uh, bringing together the uh, two sides. Also, of course, uh, we uh, had a close contact with the ministries of agriculture, trade, and the environment and their corresponding climate change uh, bureaus, departments, offices, uh, some of the uh, officials, senior officials of these uh, climate change uh, departments uh, from the various involved countries are present here and who provided a great uh, deal of uh, support and assistance. Who were the uh, participants in these public-private partnerships to support these governments? Basically, uh, these are government officials in... Uh, 
trade and uh, business associations, companies and corporations, universities, and um, the academic component is uh, just as important. And, and the agenda for these um, public-private partnerships were to uh, share national experiences and to disseminate these issues. You know, oftentimes what we need in each country is an external uh, catalytic agent so that uh, the very many interesting experiences that are uh, happening in the country are mm, publicized. And also we needed to identify issues and position climate change uh, in uh, export uh, strategies, export promotion strategies. And, uh, Finally, these uh, public-private uh, um, task forces uh, consisted in preparing action plans. Uh, of course, they were all different from the various countries, but uh, the uh, overall focus was to uh, move forward in uh, preparing the right uh, rules and regulations to strengthen oversight uh, schemes and mechanisms, disseminate information, and uh, make progress in uh, measuring and mitigating the uh, carbon footprint. The um, carbon footprint uh, measurement case studies for the uh, specific uh, expert products that we focused on became the uh, a, a central part of our project. Ruben Galossi, who is uh, here with us, was our uh, leading consultant for all these uh, case uh, studies together with other uh, Spanish uh, colleagues and from uh, elsewhere around Latin America. Uh, moreover, these uh, measurements were not directed at uh, getting any kind of a certification for the uh, companies included in the survey, nor was their purpose to uh, do some sort of academic uh, study, and um, that's uh, an important uh, consideration to be had of these uh, case studies because their main objective was to establish a sort of a benchmark for the industry or the uh, good that would uh, help in a guideline and, and in guiding public policy making and uh, strategies. The uh, participating uh, companies and corporations also uh, benefited from their uh, carbon footprint assessment um, for their own car, uh, benefit, but of course, basically the idea was to create this benchmark for uh, public uh, policy um, making or and um, industry uh, strategizing. Another important objective was to position in this uh, industry a new um, management tool with a focus on uh, energy efficiency and sustainability. The um, methodology that we chose for these uh, uh, measuring is past uh, 2050. That's a British uh, approach that uh, looks at the product's life cycle for its analysis. We did not uh, measure the organization's uh, footprint or the company's footprint. We focused on the uh, goods, which uh, is basically what markets uh, want to know. And uh, the uh, scope of uh, this assessment is what uh, we call from uh, uh, cradle to door. The cradle is the soil, the raw materials, and the door is the uh, entry point to uh, product, these products' destination markets, uh, the gateway from the from soil to the gateway. And uh, the uh, case studies uh, assessed uh, emissions from uh, use of uh, soil and uh, land use uh, changes, fuels, uh, fertilizers, power, pesticides, um, byproduct or waste product management, and uh, both local, internal, domestic, tra and international transport. All these are things that have to be taken into account when uh, we are uh, measuring or assessing a uh, carbon footprint. And that's only up to the uh, market's uh, gateway. And uh, without a doubt, the uh, starting point the starting point for this kind of a uh, job is to establish a process map, to do some process mapping. These uh, maps allow us to um, 
process maps. That's one of the process maps that uh, we're flashing the screen. It's a cradle to gate, and uh, and uh, this is um, kind of hard to uh, read from. Uh, where you are, but basically this allows us to, in uh, assessing the uh, footprint, we identify all the uh, steps of the process where there are a, a source or where there are uh, emissions, but it's also very uh, important too for the uh, uh, business people, the interpreters themselves, um, know what their uh, production process looks like. Now, um, assessing, measuring the uh, footprint, of course, helps us to get a better understanding of the uh, production processes, but it's also a, a tool for more efficient uh, production. Um, more efficient use of energy, of course, but other uh, components of the uh, production process as well. And uh, here we uh, hit upon uh, several other, several issues. In the first place, the uh, lack of uh, local data, uh, the uh, lack of uh, good records in uh, the uh, companies themselves for each of the uh, process um, stages. Um, the uh, lack of uh, national emission factors. Uh, if we, we didn't have national emission uh, factors, indicators, uh, figures that almost all countries um, have, so basically they use default values because they don't have their actual values. Um, these are the worst case scenario values and they do not really or necessarily reflect what's actually happening on the ground. And um, some of the some of these issues that we encountered uh, relate to the uh, businesses' efficiencies, but also they uh, have to do with uh, public policies, government policies, and uh, state uh, initiatives or non-initiatives. <laughs> and uh, the um, emissions by uh, process stage, like uh, cropping, processing, and distribution, of course, uh, vary depending on each uh, product or good. And contrary to what um, we may think of uh, for many of these uh, cases, the uh, distribution footprint, in other words, transportation, is uh, a uh, very small component of the uh, entire total uh, cradle-to-gate uh, footprint. Uh, what uh, this uh, shows is that for different kinds of products, uh, we see different kinds of uh, makeups. For instance, uh, palm tree oil processing accounts for the uh, th that's the uh, most relevant uh, component. That uh, plane is uh, emitting a lot of greenhouse effect gases and. Uh, and also making a lot of noise. <laughs> and uh, for the case of cocoa, 94% of the uh, footprint comes from the um, cultivation itself, from cropping. In in the case of coffee, it's uh, sort of a 50-50 split. Some crops, and uh, this is particularly relevant, um, manage to basically make up or include so over compensate their emissions by uh, carbon sequestration and uh, storage and the plantations themselves. And this is something that uh, is not usually taken into account when uh, we uh, assess emissions. That is, to include in those uh, measurements and assessments, for, uh, carbon uh, assessments, the uh, capture, sequestration, and storage uh, component. Another um, item that uh, is uh, worth uh, looking into is that uh, there is a huge uh, diversity of uh, emissions by company, by production firm. Um, the uh, say the co coffee footprint as um, kilos of uh, CO2 per uh, kilo of coffee can fluctuate 
mm, from less than one to as much as seven. That's uh, shown here. And these are the figures the, uh, I'm talking about. Now, why such a great variability? Given the fact that these are very similar firms, and the first observation is the quality of the data. To begin with, the uh, measurement uh, processes for the uh, footprint are only as good as the uh, as the data that the companies uh, provide us with. Another relevant issue in this respect is uh, changing uh, land use patterns. And uh, in the uh, PIS 2050 methodology, uh, a, a, a company that uh, changed its uh, land use uh, 21 years ago uh, will not include that factor in its footprint assessment, whereas a company that uh, kicked off uh, 19 years ago uh, would include uh, land, change, land use changes in its uh, footprint assessment and calculations. Uh, this is another factor that uh, distorts uh, this kind of uh, data. For instance, let's look at this company here in particular. They indeed have a significant amounts of emissions because of changes in the land use uh, batteries. Also important are uh, waste management and the uh, use of uh, various uh, sources or types of energy. And um, um, <coughs> this uh, shows the relative uh, importance of uh, the various um, destination markets when it comes to the uh, transportation uh, footprint. However, this is at uh, best or worst, at three to five percent of the uh, total uh, emissions. Well, then, what is the um, business? or industry's uh, reaction when it comes to uh, footprint uh, Gustavo Gandini from the uh, Benalino Co-op uh, that uh, grows organic bananas. And that's a very uh, good example. Uh, well, Gustavo will be talking about that. Uh, this is a rather uh, new issue in the uh, corporate agenda. Uh, firms measure their uh, footprint for several reasons, for cost reduction, to identify efficiency issues, uh, some, not a few among them because they are environmentally aware, also because they are anticipating environmental uh, requirements from their markets or also to build a better public image, an image, a better image before the public. Um, they are kind of uh, proactive because of this uh, green protection or, or should they be proactive to uh, put an emphasis on the positive agenda? Our conclusion uh, and uh, I think that this is a conclusion that is uh, shared by many of the companies that uh, we uh, uh, worked with is it is better to be proactive to invest in sustainability and oftentimes the uh, steps uh, that are required do not really uh, require large um, assessments, but I will not, I will, don't want to uh, wrap up uh, before telling you that uh, ECLAC is uh, launching this uh, new initiative. We are taking the initial steps, we're taking the baby steps of a project to encourage um, uh, Latin American growers Landmark and growers in defining the environmental standards that will uh, govern uh, industrial uh, markets. Basically, we're talking about a pilot program that uh, is underway in the European Union to set up uh, environmental standards for food products in particular. There are other 11, excuse me, 11 products that are comprised, but actually this program initiative is open to all interested parties, whether from or not from the uh, uh, European community that are interested in joining this process. And we um, incentivize, we actually encouraged the uh, Colombian uh, Coffee Growers uh, Federation to um, uh, have a uh, coffee included in this initiative 
matter of fact is uh, Colombian coffee growers are now members of the uh, Coffee Technical Secretariat for this initiative. We also set up the uh, LAC uh, Coffee uh, uh, carbon uh, footprint uh, with uh, members from uh, government and industry from 10 countries, 10 Latin American countries, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Peru, and the uh, DR. And our whole idea behind this is that uh, we can uh, actually uh, bring the uh, growing countries' uh, uh, viewpoint to this uh, process that will rely to, re result in the new environmental standards for a product, a product uh, environmental standards that will governing the uh, European uh, market and very likely uh, most international markets in uh, industrial uh, countries. Um, there's a wide room for public policy making that will have a positive impact on all these processes. There's uh, things that we can use and tools that we can use uh, taxes, green taxes, uh, subsidies, uh, regulations, land use, uh, management, and controls. And a central issue that I already mentioned is the um, uh, establishing each country's uh, emission factors, country-specific uh, emission factors. Uh, we can only hope that on the road to COP 2015 in Paris, we can uh, build even stronger processes. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Alicia. Very interesting, as you all see the possibilities of a study of this type. And uh, to conclude uh, this panel, but not the event, because what I want is for all of you to participate, and that is why I'm chasing after panelists, <laughs> I, I'm going to now uh, hand uh, the, uh, cede the floor to Gustavo uh, Gandini, who, uh, in addition to participating in the Banana Cooperative, is the director of the Organic Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Environmental Division of this company in Dominican Republic. But it turns out that in addition to that, Gustavo has participated. Uh, he He's from Honduras. Uh, he studied in Honduras at the Pan American Agricultural School uh, in Zamorano. So that's very interesting. And also in Cuba. Uh, he studied his doctorate in Cuba, and so, in some way, Gustavo is uh, sort of this uh, Central American, part of the Central American Isthmus, uh, and with a, a product that is so central uh, and so relevant to our region as is bananas. and. And this discussion with the, uh, between these middle-income countries and Europe, uh, I think Gustavo, well, let, Gustavo, you have the floor. Uh, well, good afternoon, you all. And uh, what um, what Alicia says is very true. Uh, these are situations that fill your heart and your spirit with pride. I'm a Colombian by birth, and, and but I had the honor of. I had the honor of studying at an agricultural school in San Marano in Honduras and look uh, at the surprise, one of the ones uh, who are behind this event is the government of Honduras. This was a place that, that educated me in the inorganic production. And I will finish, uh, uh, and, and I ended up living in Dominican Republic where I am happily married with a Dominican woman, and as we in the field says, you don't, you don't bring firewood to the forest, and so you cook with the wood in the forest. And so I have three Dominican children. And what I mean to say by this is that the world is not divided, but rather uh, the world is all of us, and it belongs to all of us. And this is very important to have as a perspective, because climate change affects us all uh, without uh, regard to our nationality. Uh, since I am the last one, I can pick up on some things that were said, uh, in particular uh, by economists who spoke before me. And uh, above all, something that Alicia said when she uh, labels, uh, when she rates agriculture with a small, very small percentage but that it, uh, of the economy, but you must understand that producers are the ones who feed everyone and also give them the energy to live. And so you need to keep that in mind uh, uh, when working on anything because we are the engine of the human body.
Uh, over these last few days I've spent here on climate change, something very interesting has happened. This is a, a view of the children of the, the workers in uh, agricultural production. Ladies and gentlemen, we here in this panel, oftentimes we are questioned by young people who, who question us on climate change. And I hope uh, and, and with uh, a commitment by all of us who are here that in 20 or 30 years, uh, when those of us who are here in the panel will not be here and so it'll be you it'll be some it'll be young people sitting up here I hope that they are not questioned the way we are being questioned on what we've done with the world and so for that reason I uh, introduced to you the generation we need to work for uh, in the present not in the future uh, basically and uh, for reasons uh, of, due to related to time I won't go too deep into this, but it is basically a, a mission and uh, of Vanellino, but it's basically uh, focused on a system that must be sustainable. Uh, economists speak much of profitability, but profitability should not be above sustainability but rather uh, profitability is a component of sustainability. I can speak very nicely of the Vanellino model, but if uh, those 372 producers that make up the cooperative uh, every week, uh, if they are not uh, given a, a return on their work, we're talking uh, nothing and so we're talking about nothing and so it's very important that within the framework of sustainability we have profitability built in and so it hurts to hear in a place uh, in, such as this to always question that development will be limited to destroying the environment we have the processes to grow uh, all the while growing with the environment. It's just that we can't close our eyes and continue walking along the same path that we are going in. Uh, it's important uh, to note that Banalino produces around 500 tons of bananas per week. Uh, these are roughly 30 containers of 30, 40 foot containers that pick up around 40,000 uh, box crates, of which 40% are organic. The rest are producers who go in and have to go into uh, go into the certification process, and they're either cataloged as either organic or conventional. And within the world trade, one of the advantages of organic trade is that I can sell organic with my certification. But if needed, I can sell in the conventional market. So this is a model that is very efficient, effective. Uh, trade-wise because it encompasses both markets. We are certified uh, uh, as organic, as fair trade, as a uh, global gap, which originally it was, uh, uh, there was had a different labeling due to some needs in the European markets, which is our main uh, customer. 90% uh, uh, of our bananas go to Europe. And, and we have other certifications because there are many markets that have quality controls that uh, for us. And so I brought you this slide because it shows something that a supermarket in Germany is doing where they are not using cardboard, but they are using these plastic plastic uh, crates that have a useful life of five years and they come and go in the in the uh, carts that go back and forth through Europe. Uh, uh, it is a German system that is characterized by having a very sustainable uh, line of use. And so now getting into uh, the carbon uh, footprint issue. Uh, we, we at Banalino had the opportunity to, uh, due to a law that was not implemented in France, uh, all the, uh, we had this, we had all the agricultural products uh, needed to have their cap or carbon footprint uh, included in the in the labeling. We were measured by Carrefour. We got the uh, the footprint, but what we didn't like about this model was that it measured us as a as a factory. We are not a factory. We are agro industry, but these are agro industries that start from a point of a principle of collecting or sequestering carbon and so I remember it clearly that somebody said to me yeah but you're not interesting because you're too clean and we need people who are dirty so that we can say that we are transforming and you know and, and so you know we're the wrong kind because organics always try to not contaminate and so this is uh, a 
a sheet that shows what the project was with CEPAL. The FAO has the International Banana Forum. They also did a carbon footprint study that adapted itself more to agriculture. And with what we did with CEPAL, and thanks to to the, the talks we held, uh, we managed to implement a model that at that time was not very polished, I think, uh, but that has been uh, evolving, that assessed carbon sequestering. Uh, those who have, who do agriculture need to put the carbon sequestering in our seal. Plants, uh, those of you who have not gone or don't remember biology, plants are made up of 97% gases, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and, and hydrogen. And plants have the ability to connect these. And so we need to put a number to this so that our footprint cannot be compared to that of a company that that is simply generating emissions. Uh, okay, we were issued a certification. We have a footprint that to us was very interesting. As uh, Alicia said, it is backed uh, as of at the moment of production. It does not include European distribution. Uh, that has a high component of uh, fuel consumption because it goes in through a port in Belgium uh, where it is then uh, sent out to the entire European Union. But what's important about this fact that we found it was that we understood that uh, an amount of information that we have reserved for the certifying entity that comes certify as, as organics or as fair trade or as global gap is useful to measure carbon footprints. And so oftentimes many, uh, many uh, farmers think that it's an extra effort, but no, we just need to adapt, get this added value that at a given moment will also be a, char a characteristic for us to be able to compete in the international market. Small producers, and this has been shown in this year, the year of family agriculture, they move the worldwide community. And so these are mechanisms to make us more competitive and demonstrate that cooperatives, if they join up together, uh, can be a model to follow and not a model for competition. And so this is basically the layout of what banana trade, the banana trade is, three production centers toward Asia and South America, but in the Dominican Republic we have the virtue of having, well, Asians generally just supply the Asian market, Africans supply the European market, and we supply all three markets, and so we need to take advantage of these three values, and the more added value we give our products, the, the more benefits we will have, and the the, the assurance that these producers can live, as, a minister, as Minister Jose Antonio said, with a human face. Because 350 producers live in rural communities, they support their families, and they support the community, and they give them a quality of life uh, in this way. Quality goals, uh, these are things we propose for ourselves, but what I want uh, is to, for us to know what good did we derive from this? Well, locally, Banalino, we've... Uh, this is a company that has a, a, a large name in the Dominican Republic and has benefits because we are taking into account on many uh, work-related issues and health-related issues. But something I found out here that oftentimes, you know, uh, people waste what they have. I, uh, Omar, has has uh, taken the Dominican Republic uh, to be a, to to a position where they're a leader in training in in, in climate change and to in educating producers and the children of producers who need to have this in their heads and the workers, both Dominican as well as migrants and their children. Uh, the use of results at the country level, we are working, uh, Dominicana is, uh, be, uh, Dominican Republic is recognized as the primary organic producer of cocoa and bananas in the world and we need to uh, profit from this and identify new markets. The, the American market is opening and it's very interesting because it has a very large volume. Uh, we need to raise our competitive level and also to follow the process of utilizing the footprint to see how we can be most useful. I want to thank 
Cepal, uh, and I'm going to say it in Spanish, the ICTSD, uh, so as not to uh, get tangled up with the, with the, I want to thank the Honduran government because uh, uh, I would say it's my third home because in the Repu Dominican Republic I have my first, well, I don't even know where home is, but uh, let's just say that, you know, some, to the Dominican government and, uh, well, and because I was welcomed within the Dominican uh, delegation and I'd like to thank the French uh, delegation that hosts us here. And so thank you all. Uh, you know, may you profit from this. Have some organic food. Uh, Peru produces organic food. And so very good day to all. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. I think the only complaint we have is that he didn't bring us bananas. Uh, and I think that's very important. But anyway, uh, I wanted to give you time to uh, maybe add some comments or questions. We have exactly three minutes before closing the panel. So if anybody has a question uh, there, uh, quickly uh, two questions and three questions, uh, four questions. And with that, we close and we'll give our panelists one minute each. Okay, question back there. Quick, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Claudio Latour from the Inter-American Development Bank. And so uh, my question is, uh, do you believe that if, uh, that if the international, uh, the, if these certification systems are implemented internationally and reinforced, would America, Latin America would win or they would lose in general terms? Meaning, uh, do you believe that the, these commerce ministries and these producers in Latin America, do you think it's in their interest to get involved in this issue? Good question. Let's go over there. Uh, we had another person over there? Uh, okay, there. Right back there. Right there behind you. Right behind you. There. All right. Well, there. All right. Uh, okay, gracias. Soy Sumaya de Sudán. Y... Okay. Eh, eh, pregunto sobre... Pregunto sobre... Ah, okay. Sorry. I am asking of how to sensitize the private sector to enter the carbon market. Con respecto al, al mar Because uh, in our developing country, it is very uh, difficult to, to convince this sector to, to enter this, uh, this, uh, this uh, aspect. And we need a lot of work so as to sensitize the private sector to enter the, uh, private, the carbon market. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Here we are. Aquí atrás otra vez. Y luego pasamos aquí. So back here, then we'll go forward here uh, in the front here, and we have two questions. So La Torre, el Consejo. Uh, from uh, the, the Climate Change uh, Commission of the Mexican government, what is the challenge for uh, inserting uh, carbon emissions in the account, in the carbon accounting systems nationally and regionally? Good question. Okay, and we go uh, back there with our colleague. Uh, we had a, a lady there, uh, please, and behind her, uh, the last one. Oh, no, here. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting event. My name is Laura Soasso from Honduras. I work for the University of Zamorano with my colleague there, and it's a pleasure to see his, to see these organic products uh, that ha where the, these uh, fellow alumni have this, this mentality. One of the our, my questions is: in our university, we are putting a lot of uh, focus on the Central American region, in particular with this issue of dry the, the, the dry Central American corridor, and with this great impact that climate change is having in particular in our country and in the region. Uh, so we are beginning a pilot project uh, that is very interesting with support from the Swiss cooperation to measure our own uh, footprint as a university and we are in search organizations and information universities. Well, I'd like to know if CEPAL, in, uh, that's specifically for you, Ms. Alice, Mrs. Alicia, if CEPAL has uh, an initiative in, along these lines of joining efforts with some academies in particular, because we are the ones who in some way uh, influence all of these agricultural uh, professionals who are going to go and influence uh, or other agro-industrial uh, professionals. And it's very important for us to change this mentality toward the future. Uh, so that what uh, he said, uh, so that we soon have different ge generations set in uh, to this uh, generating positive results. Thank you very much. Congratulations.
thank you, Laura. And our last question uh, up here, and then we go to the panel. Uh, good afternoon, Roberto Guerra from Honduras, uh, project coordinator for adaptation to climate change, uh, and with uh, U European Union funds and uh, the, Euro the Honduran government funds. Uh, uh, with this uh, model of from cradle to the door, uh, do you think that if there it will be uh, anything, uh, any issue with? Uh, uh, with these companies, for example, where you have Andu Palma, Coa Palma, uh, these associations that use bioenergy and produce energy uh, from their waste, uh, where uh, these are products of uh, the transformation of African palm? Very, very important question. Well, all right, so we'll start now for, with the panel. I don't know if we start w from the right with Ingrid uh, so that we don't, uh, so we don't, so that she's not bored. Uh, okay, muchas gracias. gracias. I'd just like to comment on the two first questions. On uh, First, would Latin America win or lose from life cycle analysis? And second, how to sensitize the private sector? Um, I think that they, they, are com they are linked because I think that uh, Latin, Amer Latin America is a region which has advantages for producing um, food uh, uh, with a low uh, level of embedded carbon. And I think that uh, there is a demand for that in developed countries in particular. Uh, many climate mitigation policies exclude uh, the food sector and the, and the agricultural sector, which means that there are all these private initiatives of labeling and so on. And I think that that is a way for um, exporters to create a niche market uh, in many developed countries. So I actually think that uh, there would be benefits um, to many producers. So if they can see the benefits instead of the costs, that would be a, a way of sensitizing them. Gracias, Ingrid. KG, vamos a dejar a los organizadores que cierren. Bueno, muy breve. ¿Aló? ¿Aló? ¿Te ha aprendido? Ah, sí. Sí. Eh, sí, muy brevemente porque le quería pasar la palabra a los expertos en el área, pero con respecto a la pregunta del BID, que me parece muy interesante, si la certificación conviene o no. Pero creo que la pregunta... En realidad, como alguien dijo, no es la rentabilidad, sino eh, también es, es este, la obligación eh, para, para nuestras, las nuevas generaciones también. Por eso, yo no plantearía esto de una forma de rentabilidad, como lo haríamos los economistas, pero de la necesidad y también considerando este, el impacto al, al medio ambiente. Y sobre la sensitación no sé si es una palabra en español, eh, de la población sobre el, sobre el mercado de, de carbono. Eh, justo hoy en la mañana estábamos hablando en el taxi, como había un taco para, para entrar acá, un tráfico, como dicen. Eh, y, y parece que en la República Dominicana, tal vez Gustavo puede decirnos un poco más, eh, tienen un proyecto este, para educar a los jóvenes para que regresen a, desde la ciudad a, a, lo, a, los, este, a sus propios pueblos, claro, o que no se vayan también. En el caso de Japón, había hace 20 años atrás, eh, me acuerdo que había eh, una migración en forma de U, eh, de asalariados en sus 40 que regresaban a los pueblos a hacer eh, agrícolas de una forma eficiente. Alicia. Sí. Rápidamente ya tenemos que partir. Eh, yo estoy segura que con una certificación más generalizada eh, Latinoamérica y el Caribe sale ganando. ¿Por qué? Porque efectivamente muchos de estos productores del sector exportador eh, ya tienen incorporado a, a través de sistemas de certificación eh, de distinta índole, los mostraba Gustavo, eh, una preocupación por su so sostenibilidad. Yo diría están en bastante buen pie. Eh, un tema que creo que tiene que ver con un par de preguntas que se hicieron sobre cómo avanzar a nivel nacional, eh, creo que es urgente la necesidad de fortalecer a... Eh... Strengthen the... Uh... Uh, institutes, uh, standards, organizations that are usually the uh, 
poor relatives in the uh, government uh, apparatus, but uh, these uh, sort of uh, underwriters or certifications, certifiers or certifiers, um, organizations are um, uh, paramount, and uh, that's a crucial uh, task that needs to be undertaken, and also so that we don't have to rely on uh, outside consultants and um, foreign initiatives and expertise. And uh, briefly, uh, when talking about uh, the uh, carbon uh, market that uh, the lady from Sudan wondered about, matter of fact is that in the uh, general context of these kinds of uh, projects, our interest is, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll be done in a minute, is to mitigate the footprint, to reduce the footprint. And uh, it is uh, great also if we can have some side uh, beneficial effects, but our focus is not on in international uh, uh, carbon uh, certificates, uh, deals, or transactions. Gustavo, you have one second. Because <laughs> there is this gentleman here who is going to evict us from the podium. I would. Uh, my general message is that we should not focus on creating a carbon market. Rather, let's engage in uh, non-polluting, no emissions uh, products. And you will see that people are going to start buying your products. You have to be aware of what you're doing and uh, spread the word. And the benefits will come by uh, selves. Organic option is a good valid action. Everybody wants sweet organic that they may not be able because of transportation or price issues. That's a different thing. Most of us perhaps not, do not. But uh, this is the kind of market that we need to develop and work. The event and uh, well, to close this um, yes. panel, I want to start to uh, congratulate um, ECLAC and I want to uh, congratulate uh, uh, growers like Gustavo that have understood that um, the uh, world's uh, economy in the 21st century, the way it's operating, that it needs to be understood. And also we have to get hand of uh, climate change because that's a reality and we have to act in consequence. So as a reply to uh, uh, Gustavo said, the, uh, this is a win-win uh, proposition for the entire region. If the uh, region decides to change its uh, production uh, structures, its uh, trade flows, so that uh, they will be at the forefront be laggards when it comes to competitiveness. Alicia emphasized the importance of uh, acting in a proactive uh, manner, given the fact that the world economy is uh, sort of in the doldrums. And uh, there, what uh, really matters is that we uh, identify opportunities. Um, given the uh, global uh, and climate change uh, challenges. So uh, my uh, congratulations for the work you're doing uh, specifically and uh, throughout the region so that uh, we can uh, move towards uh, building these low carbon economies. Thanks uh, to the two Alicias for their support uh, and a journey also that is uh, also uh, providing very uh, much support to us. And I would like to uh, mention as a takeaway home that uh, we uh, need to put a lot of emphasis in public policy making. That's why we have here a uh, the uh, minister and uh, vice ministers and the uh, Honduran environmental uh, department. And